today. And I have a word from the Holy Spirit to share with you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Uh, we're looking at the letters of the New Testament right now and listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Galatians 2. We're going to talk about Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl. Galatians, uh, which is a little different today. But let's talk about a church potluck supper gone terribly bad. Galatians 2 and beginning in verse 1, Paul says, 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the gospel I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. That question came up only because some so-called Christians there, false ones really, who were secretly brought in, sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations, but we refused to give in to them for a single moment because we wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel for you. We won't read the next few verses, but Paul gives the outcome of that meeting with Peter and James and John and the rest of the apostles, and he says they added nothing to his gospel. They recognized the apostolic ministry that God had bestowed upon Paul, and they extended their right hand of partnership, and they agreed that Peter should go to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. But let's pick up in verse 11 and read about a church supper gone wrong. Look at Galatians 2 and verse 11. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to publicly oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who were not circumcised, but afterwards, when some friends of James came from Jerusalem, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted upon the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw they were not following the truth of the gospel, I addressed Peter. Now, we won't take time to read Paul's lecture, but it ends with the first statement in Paul's writings of the doctrine of justification by faith. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the people you love so much. I thank you for your presence here. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would come and breathe life among us. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. You know, for a holy book, I find the Bible surprisingly human. The Bible is the biographies of real people who had very real human struggles. The Bible is not fairy tales. It is not folk legends about mythical characters with superhuman powers. The Bible is the real life stories of tragically flawed men and women whose lives were dramatically changed when they had an encounter with the living God. One of my precious friends began his journey from Hinduism to faith in Jesus Christ when a young woman challenged him to read the Bible. He started in the book of Genesis and only a few pages into the Bible, he almost quit reading because he was appalled that a holy book could contain such unseemly stories of rape and affairs, incest, murders, lying, betrayal, revenge. Can I tell you that actually that is one of the evidences for the reliability of the Bible? If you were going to make up fantastical stories about religious heroes, why would you write such things about them unless it were true? If you were going to invent a glorious, perfect savior for the world, why would you go out of your way to introduce him as the descendant of a prostitute and an adulterous woman and a jinxed widow and a woman who committed incest unless it's true? If you were going to reinvent a mere man called Jesus into a heavenly God-man and then present yourself as his authorized spokesman, why would you depict yourself as a bunch of bumbling boobs unless it were true? 
The Bible is surprisingly human. Christianity is surprisingly human. Jesus saves people with real life struggles. He saves people who have had major flops and major fails, who are tragically flawed. Here is a faithful saying, Christ died to save sinners. I want to talk to you this morning about a very real human struggle, one that I've battled with my entire life, and one from which none of us is immune. It's the struggle against criticism. Now, there are forms of criticism that are helpful to us and are productive in our lives. Constructive criticism has your best interest at heart. The intent is to make you stronger, wiser, better, happier, more effective. Actually, constructive criticism is something that we pursue. It's something we even pay for. If you hire a business consultant to help you increase efficiency, you are paying for constructive criticism. If you hire a golf pro to help you improve your swing, you are paying for constructive criticism. But that's not the kind of criticism I want to talk about today. I want to share with you about overcoming destructive criticism, or as some people refer to it, deconstructive criticism, critical criticism, contrarianism. The intent of destructive criticism is to harm you. It destroys your self-esteem. It wounds your spirit. It robs your security. It destroys your reputation. It destroys what you've built, what you've created. Last Monday, I was sitting in a waiting room with my daughter, Maddie, and I began to read Galatians 2. I happened to be reading the New Living Translation, which I don't normally read, but it's the only thing I had with me. And I began to read about the story of Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl. And when I read these words, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was afraid of criticism Suddenly, the Holy Spirit began to download this word to me. What I want to share with you this morning is deeply personal. And I want to tell you, it is one of the most helpful things that the Lord has ever said to me. And I hope maybe it'll help you too. Looking at the story of Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl, I'm struck first by the reality that no one is exempt from criticism. No one can avoid criticism. Aristotle said, to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. You know, actually, I found that that's not even true. If you try that strategy, you'll still be criticized for doing nothing. <laughs> you can't even avoid criticism by dying for crying out loud. They'll say you died too soon or too sick or too slowly or too suddenly. Criticism is an unavoidable part of the human experience. And beloved, listen to me. Criticism is something that persists through your entire lifetime. No matter how accomplished you become, no matter how elevated you become, no matter how celebrated you become, you will still be criticized. And listen, this is important for us as believers. No matter how Christ-like you become. No matter how spirit-filled you become, no matter how much fruit of the Spirit you bear, no matter how many gifts of the Spirit you manifest, no, how no matter how much authority in the realm of the Spirit you wield, no matter how high the ministry office God bestows upon you, you will still be criticized. How do I know? Because Jesus was criticized. And he was the most Christ-like, Holy Ghost-filled, authoritative man that ever lived. Jesus had no fault in him, and yet people still found fault with him. And after Jesus, Galatians 2 tells us that Peter and John and James and Paul and the rest of the apostles were criticized too. You know, knowing everything that we do about the apostles, I have to tell you the truth, that kind of blows my mind a little bit. Oh, it's, it's not hard to imagine criticism coming from the world at large. Jesus told us to expect that. They thought he was nuts and they think we're nuts. But it's hard for me to imagine people within the church criticizing the apostles. I mean, we're talking about Peter here, people. Peter, who had been handpicked by Jesus 
and who was with Jesus every step of the journey from beginning to the end. Peter who walked on water. Peter to whom Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Peter, who was the first apostle to see Jesus risen from the dead. Peter, who grabbed the hand of a man who had never once walked and said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up. And the man went walking and leaping and praising God. Peter, who had preached to crowds of thousands and had won thousands and thousands of converts to Christ. Peter, who possessed a radial healing anointing so that the people lined up along the streets of Jerusalem because they got healed just by him walking by. Peter, who was the recipient of revelation after revelation from the Holy Spirit. Peter, who was sprung from prison by angels on multiple occasions. Peter, who was lied to by Ananias and Sapphira and watched while their dead bodies were carried away. I don't know about you, but I would tread a little lightly around Peter. And yet people in the church criticized him. And not only Peter, but Paul as well. Paul, who saw Jesus on the Damascus Road. Paul, who pronounced blindness on Elamis, the sorcerer. Paul, who said, stand up to a man born with crippled feet. And the man jumped to his feet. Paul, who performed signs and wonders so miraculous that he had to stop people from worshiping him as a god. Paul, who was stoned to death outside of the city gate of Iconium, but Jesus raised him to life again. In fact, it was from a member of the Iconium church that we have what we believe is an authentic physical description of Paul. Apparently, he wasn't very easy on the eyes. He, he wasn't a looker. He was no Robbie Boucher. <laughs> but it says when he preached, his face shone like an angel. Really? You're going to mess with Peter and Paul? You're going to mess with John and James and Jesus. What that tells me is that no one is exempt from criticism. Looking at Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl, another thing that strikes me is insight on people who criticize. What kind of people level destructive criticism at us? Paul, do you remember those guys from the Muppets, the critics? Paul describes the critics in Galatians 2. He says, some false brothers infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ and to make us slaves. They belong to the circumcision group. Paul is talking about a group of Jews who called themselves Christ followers, but they insisted that everyone must keep the Jewish customs of circumcision and holy days and kosher laws. They began making trouble first in the Jerusalem church. Then they followed Paul to the church he pastored at Antioch. They raised a ruckus at a potluck supper. And then they went to Paul's new churches that he had started all over Galatia, which is now in Turkey, modern day Turkey. And they started causing trouble there. And that's why Paul wrote this letter that we're reading today. But looking at Paul's words, I find some insight on people who criticize. First of all, people who criticize are not free. And they're jealous that you are. Paul said, critics came to spy on the freedom we have in Christ. Beloved, listen to me. Critical people are bound. They are not living in the freedom of Jesus Christ. I grew up in an alcoholic family. But I never understood the nature of an alcoholic or an addictive personality until I became an adult. And one thing that is true about them is that they are hypercritical. You see, the inner pain, the self-loathing, the guilt that they have inside, it is directed outwardly at fault-finding in other people. They set standards that no one can meet. They create expectations that no one can fulfill. They resent people for not measuring up, and then they punish them. But rather than helping them feel better about themselves, the verbal abuse and the criticism that they dish out, it only leads to more self-loathing and then to more self-medicating. It is a vicious, destructive cycle. Critics are hypocritical. 
They impose impossible standards on others that they themselves do not keep. Jesus said that to the Pharisees. He said, you heap heavy burdens on other people that you yourselves would never carry. Critics are not people of grace. They don't understand grace. They don't have grace. They don't show grace. But I never realized until we started our Pathways ministry here at Harvest Time a couple of years ago is that even after people stop drinking, even after they stop taking drugs or acting out in whatever way they are, that critical personality remains a part of them until Jesus sets them free. Jesus said that God sent him to proclaim liberty to the captives, and this is precisely the kind of captivity Jesus is talking about. Listen to me. You don't have to remain bound and critical. There's freedom in Jesus Christ. What kind of people criticize? Go ahead. Give the Lord a praise if you want to. What kind of people criticize? People who criticize are unfulfilled. They're discontent with their own lives. They're dissatisfied with their own outcomes. They're disappointed with their own results. People who criticize are unfruitful. Since they produce no fruit of their own, they inspect yours and they steal yours. This is good preaching right here. I'm telling you, by the time I'm done, you're going to have to get the CD because you need to listen to this one more than once. One day, a church lady asked the famous evangelist D.L. Moody, she said to him, she criticized him. She said, you know, I don't like the way you do evangelism. So D.L. Moody asked her, well, how do you do evangelism? She said, I don't. So D.L. Moody said, well, then I like the way that I'm doing it better than the way that you're not doing it. You see, those who can't criticize. Critics don't build anything. They only tear down with their mouths. What kind of people criticize? People who are not spirit-filled. They don't live by the spirit. They don't rely upon the spirit. They are not led by the spirit. They operate in the flesh. They manipulate and they maneuver. Listen, here's one telltale sign. There's never peace around them. They don't live in peace. They don't operate in peace. There's always a tempest in a teacup. There's always a storm. There's always a crisis. Let me tell you, that is a sure sign that someone is operating out of the flesh and not operating out of the spirit. They use flattery and fear. That's good preaching right there. That wasn't in my notes. That one's for free. (laughs) They use flattery and fear. They flatter one person in order to gain a hearing so that they can criticize another. People who criticize do not have a divine assignment, but they do have an agenda. Peter and Paul had a divine assignment. James and John and the other apostles had divine assignments. The critics did not have a divine assignment, but they did have an agenda, and that was to control. And that's what critics always want to do. They want to gain or maintain control. They want to run the show. What kind of people criticize? People who criticize do not understand and appreciate your call, your anointing, nor your sphere of ministry. The apostles were clear that God had sent Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. Peter and Paul had unique anointings. They had unique ministries and unique audiences, but the critics understood nothing about that. They criticized Paul for not being like Peter, and they criticized Peter for not being like James, and so on. And your critics, they'll do you the same way. They'll criticize you for not being like someone else. Why don't you preach like this one? Why don't you prophesy like that one? Why don't you pray like him or praise like her? They don't get that God made you uniquely. They don't get that God uniquely called you and anointed you and equipped you to do something in the world that only you can do. They don't get that you're not supposed to be Peter or James. You are supposed to be you. What kind of people criticize? People who criticize do not fear the Lord nor love and value his church. They're not promoters. They are promoters of self rather than promoters of God's peace and God's people. What kind of people criticize? People who criticize are on assignment from the enemy. Paul uses interesting words to describe the critics. He says that they were enemy spies. 
And that's exactly what they were, unwitting agents of the enemy, the devil controlled by a religious spirit. And beloved, your critics are the same. They are agents of the enemy sent to destroy you. Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl. No one is exempt from criticism. Insight on people who criticize, to criticize. A third thing I see, no one is immune to criticism. Given who Peter was, I'm amazed that he was the object of criticism. But I'm even more amazed that he succumbed to the criticism. That says a lot about how powerful criticism really is. It's powerful enough to intimidate even the most powerful men on earth. It's powerful uh, enough to cause even seasoned leaders to make rookie mistakes. How powerful is criticism? Criticism opens old wounds and it exploits old weaknesses. Beloved, criticism takes you backwards. And that's exactly what it did to Peter. When the Jewish rule keepers showed up in Antioch and criticized him for eating a potluck supper with Gentile believers, their criticism took Peter backwards. It took Peter back to the time before the ministry of mighty miracles. It took Peter back to the time before he was the fearless leader of the Pentecostal revival. It took Peter back to the time before he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It took him back to the time before Jesus' cross and resurrection. That criticism took him back to the night that he was standing in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house, warming himself by the fire. And a little servant girl said to him, Hey, I know you. You're one of his followers, aren't you? And he denied it. Earlier, Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. What was Satan's sifter? It was criticism. Apparently, there was something in the character of Peter that made him especially vulnerable to criticism, and Satan knew it. Beloved, can I tell you, the people who are the most outspoken, the leaders out front, the people who are most visible are often the people who are also most vulnerable to criticism. Criticism has the power to take us all backwards. It takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Because implicit in Satan's seduction of Adam and Eve was destructive criticism. You're deficient. You're lacking. You're incomplete. You are not thoroughly loved. That's why God asked Adam and Eve, who told you that you were naked? Who told you you were missing something? Who told you that there was something incomplete about you? You see, in God, they were all sufficient. Beloved, listen to me. At the heart of every word of destructive criticism is the whisper of Satan himself trying to convince you, you are not good enough. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can cause you to forget your hard-learned lessons and your hard-earned victories. It's hard to believe that Peter could forget the sting of hearing the cock crow three times. It's hard to believe that he for could forget the sting of looking into Jesus' eyes after he denied him the third time as they transferred Jesus from Caiaphas' house to the holding cell for trial the next day. It's hard to believe that he forgot the sting of Jesus' questions on the beach. Peter, do you really love me? Do you really love me? Do you really love me? Asking him once for each time he had denied Christ. That was a hard-learned lesson. And yet Peter succumbed to criticism again. It was Peter, not Paul, who first took the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter went to Cornelius' house. 
Peter preached the gospel there and the Holy Spirit fell down while he was preaching. Peter, not Paul, was the first one to eat with Gentile Christians. Peter, not Paul, was the first one to face Jewish criticism in Jerusalem. Peter, not Paul, was the first one who fought the battle for acceptance of Gentile believers into the church. It was a hard-earned victory and yet Peter succumbed to criticism. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can wear you down over time. You know, you might think that the longer you fight it, the stronger you get, but it's not so. Criticism tires you out. It chips away at you until you're tempted to do anything to avoid it. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can tempt you to compromise your Christian convictions. Don't have time to elaborate, but what Peter did at the potluck dinner was a major compromise. He ate with Gentile believers until the Jewish men came from Jerusalem, and then he ate only with fellow Jewish believers. And Paul came all kind of unglued on Peter because it was a compromise that cut to the very heart of the gospel. Whether Jewish or Gentile, we are all saved the same way, the only way, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Beloved, listen to me. There's a message, there's an important message for us to take into our heart today. Even though the particulars are different today here in America, I want to tell you that as our society grows more and more secular, criticism against biblical Christianity is mounting, and it is very powerful. It is very intense. It is very strong. The question is, will we hold fast to our Christian convictions, or we, will we crack on under the pressure of criticism. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can cause you to make leadership mistakes. Peter's compromise opened the door for other leaders to compromise too. Even Barnabas, the co-pastor of the Antioch church, stopped eating with the Gentiles in his own congregation. You see, criticism, it lures you to act beneath yourself. It pulls you to stoop down to the level of your critics. It draws you below your calling and experience. It, it draws you below your giftedness in God and causes you to act inconsistently. Barnabas was a nickname given to Joseph from Cyprus. The nickname meant the encourager, but he was anything but encouraging at the potluck brawl. Imagine how hurt half of his own congregation must have been when they were treated like second-class citizens by one of their own pastors. Beloved, it matters how you handle criticism because others are looking to you and depending upon you. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can cause you to waste valuable time and energy trying to please unpleasable people. You know, I'm pretty sure that's poor grammar, but it's good preaching. <laughs> Critics will never be happy. Critics will never be pleased. They will never be satisfied. Listen, compromise never appeases critics. It only further empowers them. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can make you forget to rely on the revelation that God has given you. I want everybody to look at me for one second because this is the heart of the word that the Holy Spirit gave me sitting in a waiting room last Monday afternoon. It's remarkable that Peter should succumb to criticism over eating with Gentiles. You see, Peter received three visions from God telling him to eat non-kosher food. And after the three visions, the Holy Spirit said to him, get up, Peter, and go down and answer the door. There are some men who are looking for you. And when he opened the door, he found out that a couple days earlier, the Holy Spirit had spoken to these men in another city. They had given, the Holy Spirit had given them Peter's name and the address where to find him and sent him and said, go get him and bring him back to tell you about Jesus. It was Peter 
who told Mark while Mark was writing his gospel and he got to the words of Jesus. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that makes him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth. It was Peter who told Mark that what Jesus meant by that was that all foods are clean. How powerful is criticism that it could cause Peter to forget all the revelation that God had given him. And that's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he reminded me of how much revelation he's given to me about harvest time. See, he's shown me things that were going to happen and then they happened. He's given me revelation through prophetic words. He's given me revelation through dreams that I've had and dreams my wife has had and dreams that other people in our ministry have had. He's given me revelation through open visions in the sanctuary. Sometimes I see them while I'm preaching. He's given me revelation through pictures that he's given our intercessors while we've been praying together. He showed me the Greenwich outpouring a week before it began. He has shown me people coming and going in and out of our church specifically. He's shown me that some people are not in the sphere of my ministry. He has shown me phase two completed. That's how I know it's going to get done because I have his promise. And he's shown me some of you who are going to help. Yes. <laughs> and as I sat in the waiting room reading about Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, Glenn, how much more revelation can I give you? When are you going to stop being controlled by the criticism and relax? Have you ever had God tell you to relax? <laughs> he said, rest in me and trust the revelation that I've given to you. I have to tell you the truth. That was one of the most helpful things that the Holy Spirit has ever said to me. And I pray that you might find it helpful too. Stop worrying about the critics in your life. They will always be there. Relax Amen. and rest in Christ and trust in the word that God has given you. How powerful is criticism? Criticism can seriously set you back and even destroy what you've labored for. Paul realized that the criticism of the rule keepers was a serious threat to the future of the church. So much so that he went up to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and James and John and the rest of the apostles to stop the damage. He said, I went to meet with them lest I was running my race in vain. What he means is lest my critics should destroy everything that I have built for Christ. You see, criticism is deadly serious. It can undo what Christ has done. It can destroy the future of a church. The answer is not to ignore criticism. The answer is to overcome it. And that's the final thing that strikes me from Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl. No one is exempt from criticism. Insight into people who criticize. No one is immune from criticism. And finally this, how to overcome criticism. How to overcome criticism. Let me give you a few quick things and we're done. First of all, we overcome criticism through confidence in Christ. Think about it. Why did Paul overcome and Peter succumb? Paul said, I didn't give in to them for a single minute. And he tells us how. In his lecture to Peter, we didn't read it, but in his lecture to Peter at the table, he uttered some of his most famous and best loved words. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So that the life I live in this body of flesh, I live by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. Beloved, 
so-called identity was rooted in the love of Christ. His identity was secure in the grace of Christ. You see, criticism says you're deficient, but Christ says my grace is sufficient for you. Paul was free from the need to please people and to earn their approval. Christ can set us free from that too. How to overcome criticism. Second, through clear Christian convictions. Beloved, listen to me. As we go into the days ahead, it is so important that we know what we believe. It's so important that we know the word of God. It's so important that we know what we believe and why we believe it. Jesus said, offenses must come. Woe to him through whom they come. But he said, offenses must come because God has a purpose in them. Beloved, God is not the author of destructive criticism, but he takes what the enemy meant for our destruction and he turns it and he uses it for our good. God used the criticism of the Jewish rule keepers. He used it to clarify the theology of the church. In the process of defending the Gentile believers at Antioch, Paul makes the first and one of the most clear statements of the Christian doctrine of justification by faith. And God positively uses negative criticism in our lives too. In the course of defending our faith, in the course of defending our Christian life, truths that are intuitive in our spirit become concrete in our minds. You see, defending ourselves from criticism leads to important discoveries in the spirit, and it makes us strong in our spirit. How do we overcome criticism? Third, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, in knowing how and when to defend yourself. Paul did not allow his critics to draw him into leadership mistakes. Paul did not stoop to their level. Paul did not fire back at them out of his flesh. His old man didn't come out of retirement. You remember Paul? He's the guy that had killer breath. If he wanted to just fillet someone with his tongue, he could have done it easily, but he didn't do that. Instead, he went up to Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit sent him up to Jerusalem. And beloved, the Holy Spirit will help us to know when and how to defend ourselves too. Listen, when Jesus stood in front of Caiaphas, when he stood in front of Pilate and Herod, he didn't open up his mouth because he was laying down his life for the sins of the world. He was fulfilling prophecies made about him. But Jesus told us to expect something different. He told us to expect that when we're on trial, that when we're in the crosshairs of criticism, the Holy Spirit will come and he will guide us in how to defend ourselves. You see, Peter vigorously defended himself under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Stephen vigorously defended himself under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Paul vigorously defended himself under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? It worked. How to overcome criticism. Finally, this. Through life-giving friendships with people of the Spirit. I have to tell you the truth. I don't have time for Christians who aren't hungry for more of God. I don't have time for people who just, they don't, you know, they don't want to grow. They're not hungry. They, they're, not, they're not pursuing Christ and more of his presence and more of his likeness and leadership. When Paul was under attack, he reached out for the friendship and the support of people of the Spirit. Paul didn't waste his time trying to appease critics. Instead, he invested in covenant relationship. He invested in accountability with people that he knew were called and were anointed and were pursuing God's will for their life. Can I tell you, we all need that. We all need life-giving friendships with people of the Spirit. We need people that we can bounce things off of and say, am I on the right track here? Is my thinking clear? Are my decisions solid? Am I going the right way? You know, it's no wonder that Paul wrote later on, we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Because actually, the enemy's strategy to destroy the church through criticism backfired. 
Oh, the enemy, he managed to raise a ruckus at a potluck supper. He'll do that from time to time. But the end result was that the apostles became tighter in their relationship with one another. The end result was that they had a deeper appreciation for one another's gifts and callings and spheres of authority. The end result was that they became more clear about their theology. The end result was that they developed a strategy for world missions moving forward that took more ground from the enemy than he ever imagined was possible. Peter will go to the Jews, Paul will go to the Gentiles, and together we'll fill the whole earth with the glory of the Lord. The devil overplayed his hand. Beloved, God will use destructive criticism positively in your life. He'll use it to cause people of influence to rally around you and support you. I remember when we applied for zoning approval to build this building almost 15 years ago now. And a man began distributing letters about our church through the town of Greenwich. It was outrageous. It called Harvest Time, it said, a sect and its followers are trying to build a compound on King Street. It made us sound like the Branch Davidians. It had just uh, ridiculous, outrageous things about us. And the letter urged people to sign a petition against our zoning application at Town Hall. Found out later the man who did it was a tenant on this property. He didn't want to lose his place of business, so he tried to undermine our zoning approval with criticism. I was heartbroken. I was at the old office when someone brought a letter that they had received in the mail and showed me what it said, and I laid it on my desk and I said, God, look at what they're saying about us. What are we going to do? But can I tell you, God used that as an occasion to rally the support of the whole town around our little church. When the leaders in town heard that criticism, they knew it wasn't true. And God used it to crystallize their good opinion towards us. And he used it to have them speak out with goodwill towards our congregation. The Greenwich Fellowship of Clergy spoke out in support of us. The First Selectmen spoke out in support of us. The Greenwich Time and the Greenwich Post ran front page stories about our congregation and our new church building. As it turned out, my wife Denise happened to be working at the time for the town planner. And she was the person who received the telephone calls from people calling in all over town to add their names to the petition. And the town planner gave my wife permission to tell people who phoned in that the contents of the letter were not true and didn't accurately represent our church. One caller said to my wife, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd think you work for that church. <laughs> Farmer John next door caught wind of what happened. He knew, we didn't know, but he knew who wrote the letter. And although we had never met him, he came to the public hearing at Town Hall to speak on behalf of the Northwest Greenwich Homeowners Association and to welcome Harvest Time Church to the neighborhood. And after the Planning and Zoning Commission had voted down 22 other proposed projects for this piece of property, they voted unanimously to allow us to build phase one and phase two on this site. You see, the criticism that the enemy meant for evil, God took and he used for our good. And I want to say to you, receive the grace of God. Receive encouragement today because God will do the same for you. The criticism that the enemy meant to destroy you, the cruel words that wounded you, every satanic whisper that said you're not good enough, you're lacking, you're incomplete, you are not thoroughly loved. Satan is going to live to regret every word because God is going to take that and he's going to turn them and use them for your good. From time to time, I mention that every sermon I write is to me, for me. Actually, the board got a little worried last year when I preached about pot. Almost every sermon I write is to me, for me, almost. Pot is not my issue. But I want to say criticism sure is. I grew up with it, and in ministry I've put up with it. 
But I am not going to succumb to criticism. I'm going to overcome it. Maybe you too have known this sting of criticism. Maybe you grew up with it too. Maybe you've put up with it too. Maybe you're in a marriage or you were in a marriage where you were abused verbally by your spouse. Actually, no one is exempt. No one is immune. But I want to say this one, this one's for me. And this one's for you. Stop letting criticism control you. Relax. Rest in Christ. Take refuge in what he's shown you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let people of the Spirit support you. And let God take what the enemy meant for your destruction and use it for your good. And that's the story of Peter, Paul, and the potluck brawl. Would you stand on your feet? Would you give Jesus, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise? Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise in this place. Hallelujah. 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 It's great to have Pastor Nick at the piano. Uh, he's counting down minutes now till he leaves for vacation. He's already in his vacation gear. <laughs> His daughter, Amanda, is graduating from college in just a couple days, and so he's going to celebrate. And many of our young people who grew up here at Harvest Time are graduating. But there was one song in particular that I just felt was a perfect exclamation point to what I shared from the Lord today. I've asked Nick to sing it. If you know it, sing along and just worship while you listen and let the Holy Spirit touch your heart. Come on, let's do it. praying yesterday afternoon couldn't help feeling from the Holy Spirit that maybe there's someone else here this weekend and you're like me maybe you grew up in a home where alcoholism or addiction was an issue and maybe you grew up with criticism that wounds the spirit that robs security you know, it's actually a vicious cycle. It's passed down from generation to generation in families. Peter wrote about that later on. He said, Christ has redeemed us from those patterns of abuse and addiction that travel from one generation to the next in our families. You know, people who grow up with that kind of criticism, you know what happens to them? They become critics. It's a cycle that just keeps perpetuating itself. But Jesus came to set the captives free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Actually, none of us are immune to criticism and none of us are exempt from criticism. Maybe in your adult life, criticism has been an issue. Somewhere, the enemy has tried to sift you with criticism. You're not good enough. You're lacking. You're deficient. You don't measure up. You're not thoroughly loved. I believe that the Holy Spirit is here today to just minister the healing of God to us. And this is what I want to ask you to do. If you would, it's just symbolic, but if criticism has been an issue for you, I want to ask you to just cup your hands, and I want you to take that criticism in your hands, and we're going to lift it up to the Lord together. If it's an issue, would you just take that criticism? Would you just hold it in your hands? And we're just going to lift it up to God. The Bible says that the ordinance that was written against us has been taken away, nailed to the cross. And here's what happens. It's a great exchange. Jesus died for our sins in exchange for our sins. So when we come to him, he takes away our sins and all the brokenness connected to it. And in exchange, he gives us his life. So if that's you, I want you to just take right now 
that criticism in your hands and would you just lift it up to God? Just lift it up to him right now and would you ask him to just take it away? And will you ask him to just give you his life in its place? Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we declare that this is the dominion of the beloved son, that this is the dominion of Jesus, that this is the sphere of his authority. Father, the enemy can't stay. He can't hinder. He can't harass here. He must go. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we lift up criticism. We lift up every wounding word. Father, we lift up every whisper from the enemy that began in our childhood and has followed us all through the days of our lives saying you're not good enough you don't measure up you're not thoroughly loved father we lift that criticism up to you and father right now i pray that you would take it away in jesus name and father that you would give us in its place your life father i break the power of criticism Father, I break the power of control through fear in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, I break the cycle of addiction, Lord, and the criticism that comes with it, Lord, that has been passed down through family lines in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would pour the love of God Come on, take that cup and lift it up, and now you're going to receive. Come on, I right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would pour the love of God by the Holy Spirit into our hearts. God, pour the love that heals, that makes whole, that makes all sufficient in Christ. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you just heal every one of us who has become a critic, Lord, because of the criticism that we've endured. Father, I pray you take away that killer breath in the name of Jesus, just like you took it away from Paul. Father, take it away. Father, I pray that we'd speak life over one another and to one another in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, Lord, for setting us free today from the power of criticism in Jesus' name. Come on, would you give the Lord a big praise in this place? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing those words, find rest, my soul. But I want to say this to you. Pathways ministry that meets every Tuesday evening and cleansing stream that meets twice a year are two ministries that can help you to just continue growing in being an overcomer in these issues in your life. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of those. I want to leave you with this encouraging word today. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Go this week in the grace of Jesus, in the love of God, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be blessed this week. Be joyful this week. Enjoy the Lord this week. God is with you. Be courageous this week. Be bold. God is going out ahead of you. It's going to be a great week in Jesus. Amen. I want you to bless about five people and tell them you're free in Jesus. Have a great week.